My work over a long period of time, three decades, maybe four decades, has been focused on the relationship between landscape and human history, the way human history shapes landscape and the way landscape, landscape shapes human history. I've particularly gotten interested in ecology and evolutionary biology, and I started writing about dangerous emerging diseases when I realized that viruses emerging from animals represent another aspect of ecology and evolutionary biology. Most of our infectious diseases are zoonotic, meaning that they are animal infections that have been transmitted to humans, and that includes COVID-19. And that happens because we come in contact with wild animals. Wild animals carry a great diversity of viruses. And when we disturb ecosystems, when we capture wild animals for, for market or kill them for food or disturb their ecosystems, cut down trees, build timber camps, we give the viruses they carry opportunities to spill over into humans. And spillover can lead to pandemic. That's what I'll be talking about at the conference. Now we think of human health and animal health and ecosystem health as one health. Very important idea, but why has it taken, a, taken us so long to come to this idea? Well, I think part of it is that we humans want to think of ourselves as godlike, as angels as separate from nature, above nature, as very, very special. And yet Charles Darwin, whose birthday it happens to be today on February 12th, as we're moving toward this conference, Charles Darwin told us 162 years ago that humans are animals. We are animals. We are connected to the natural world. We are part of it, not separate from it or above it. But that's been a hard lesson for people to accept because we want to feel special. Now we realize that it's crucial for us to accept that because unless we do, unless we understand we're part of nature, an event like the COVID-19 pandemic is completely mysterious, completely inexplicable to us. So embracing the idea of One Health brings us into the 21st century and allows us to deal with the realities of a pandemic such as this one. India is a central player, a central community of humans and other forms of living creature in this whole discussion of One Health. India is the world's largest democracy. It's one of the most ancient, rich, precious human civilizations with all of its, with its cultural diversity, its language diversity. Uh, but what some people don't realize in other parts of the world is that India is also an incredible repository of biological diversity in its unique e ecosystems, such as, for instance, the Western Ghats. And I have good friends who study biological diversity in the Western Ghats. I hope to get there myself someday on my next visit to India, perhaps. So India, India is crucial. India can lead the world in pioneering new ways of reconciling the genuine needs of people, including people who live at the margins of subsistence, people who are underserved by health care. All of our countries have them. India has its share. But India also has incredible scientific talent, intellectual talent, generally this biological diversity. India is embracing the idea of One Health um, one of the reasons I love visiting India and I love keeping in touch with my friends in India is that India is so important and has such a role to play, a leadership role to play in this new vision of, of One Health on the planet. Science writing now is an important role. It's sort of a, a professional niche between scientists and the general public. And I drifted into it myself. I began my career as a fiction writer, as a novelist. And then I drifted into writing nonfiction and I embraced writing about science because I had always been interested in the natural world. So I am one of those who now is privileged to be an intermediary between the scientific world and the reading general public. 
young people sometimes ask me, how do you do that? How do you get to that? Well, I don't recommend the route that I took, which is a very roundabout route. But if you are studying science and becoming deeply grounded in the process of science, in the history of science, in, in the mechanics, the dynamism of science, the ideas of science, then one of your options is to become a science writer and help explain this to the rest of the natural world. But it's a difficult path. So I would say, um, uh, don't try to be a writer unless you really desperately need to be a writer. I always felt that I needed to be a writer or I could never rest. It's not just an easy way to make a living. It's very difficult in its own way. It's as difficult as doing science, but it requires uh, a different combination of things. It requires talent, discipline, and luck, frankly. And if you have talent for writing about science and you develop discipline, you build the intellectual uh, muscles to sit at your desk, like this desk in this office, for hours and hours and hours at a time, staring at an empty screen, if you build that discipline, then your talent and your persistence, your discipline will eventually probably bring you luck and um, and you can achieve something in that realm.